Excuse me, I wanted to motivate the Grassmann graph or the Grassmann test, but for the advantage of time, I will sort of skip it and we'll actually go to the properties of the Grassmann graph because I'm not sure I'll be able to complete it if I have time. At the end of it, we'll come back to why this Grassmann graph was considered and why was the Grassmann test considered. So the first part we saw that uh, for some reason there was a this 2 to 2 games theorem and I said that if you had a Grassmann graph, some property of the Grassmann graph, then they were able to prove the 2 to 2 games theorem. Now let's come to, I wanted to motive, I want to spend about 10 minutes on why this Grassmann graph was studied, I'll defer this for now, but let's go in, let's plunge into the Grassmann, gra Grassmann graph and what properties of the Grassmann graph that were needed to prove the 2 to 2 games theorem. So recall from before the Grassmann graph is this graph, the ambient space is a k-dimensional vector space and the vertices of this graph are all L-dimensional subspaces of this k-dimensional vector space and two vertices are connected by an edge if they are maximally agree, they intersect on a L minus one dimensional subspace. That's the Grassmann graph given to us. Now we're going to design sort of a Grassmann test, why it fits in the two to one, two, I won't have time to go into it, but it will have two to two sort of flavor to it. So what is this test doing? So, so this test wants to, the test is, I'm going to, I'm going to give, think of, suppose f were some linear function. I give you a linear function on k bits. And I want to encode it in such a way, such that now I can query this encoding at two locations and check that, so I'm going to come up with some encoding of f. Much an encoding of f such that I can, and I want to dive, check that this encoding is a right encoding in the sense I will query this encoding at two locations and I must be guaranteed but looking at the two locations that this is actually the encoding of some linear function. What is the encoding I'm going to be looking at? The encoding is going to be sort of inspired by the Grassmann fact. So if you're given a linear function f, it's going to be encoded, then so the encoding, we're going to have one location for every L-dimensional vectors for every vertex of the Grassmann graph. The encoding is, these are some number of symbols of this one and what am I, what is the, what, what, what am I going to give at each symbol for it, at each L? I'm going to give the map of the restriction of F to this linear function, to this linear space. So I'm going to sort encode the linear function by this huge object. It is the restriction of the linear function to all L-dimensional subspaces of the vector space K. This is, I'm going to instead of write just this function, notice this has a, because it's a linear function, it has actually a very simple representation. I just have to give K bits. If I tell where the K basis vector goes, I can, it's completely specified, but I'm going to give an extremely redundant uh, encoding of it, such that I can make, check the encoding by just looking at two queries. And what's the encoding? The encoding is going to have this property. I'm going to encode it by this string. The locations in the string are indexed by vertices of the Grassmann graph. And what am I going to give at each thing? It's I'm going to give the restriction of F to that L dimensional subspace. So think of L for, think of L as much, much smaller than K. So K is some number that is growing to this one. L is, will, L is a, L is a large constant, think of L as a large constant. So I'm specifying a linear function by giving its restriction to all L-dimensional subspaces. Hmm? See some, you give it the truth table version or you just give the L bits of it. The L bits, so it's an L-dimensional subspace, so think of, for every L-dimensional subspace, think of some uh, basis for that and you just give the uh, values on that, that, that basis. So, I don't care how we are going to give it. There are potentially two power L choices for each, al each alphabet here is two power L ways of writing it. You write it in some, uh, this one. So it's given, uh, what I'm giving you is going to give you a linear function on the, that particular L dimensional subspace. Hmm? So this is K, K. This is K. Hmm? Now, now what I'm going to ask is, suppose somebody gives me this table of values. Suppose somebody gives me F from, for every Grassmann, vertex of the Grassmann graph, they give me a linear function 
on L dimensional space. Can I check that these all these linear functions actually come from one single global fun linear function? So right now this is an encoding. This is a single linear function I'm giving you, and I'm giving breaking it up into parts, and I'm giving you this. This is the encoding. Now I'm not going to now I'm not going to promise. Now instead I'm going to give just some arbitrary function, and I'm going to ask: Is there a way to check that this function actually arises from one specific linear function? Yes, of course we can test it if we are will allow to look at the whole all of this but what we will design is we'll design a two query test which has a two to two property which is going to have do this test okay so the question is okay encoding is the encoding of a linear function clear i'm going to give the encoding of a linear function by giving the restriction of the linear function to every l dimensional subspace hmm? and now i've given this now somebody gives me a word which is a purported encoding of a linear function therefore for every l dimensional subspace they are giving me some linear function it's unclear if these linear functions can be glued together to get a single larger global function what we are asking is can i test this by looking at this encoding just at a few locations and there's a natural test which is which i'm going to call the grassman test which is just pick a random edge in the grassman graph query this encoding at those two were well, l dimensional sub uh, subspaces l and l prime and check that the corresponding linear functions agree on the intersection this tells at least locally they are consistent so this is sort of stating this encoding is locally consistent does it mean it is globally consistent hmm? so let's look at some of this so one thing that should be easy to see is if f is in fact if f f is actually f restricted to l then the probability of accept is exactly one of the test certainly has perfect completeness and in fact the other way is also true that is if probability accept one then if and only if there exists a f such that there exists a linear f such that that could also be easy to true because you just walk through you 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 know it on one particular l dimensional subspace you know it on the next l dimensional subspace you get to know and there are no inconsistency therefore you can sue them all together to get a single global linear function what we are interested this is what what we are interested is the other direction suppose the test passes with some probability delta can we say something about capital f we say that capital f somehow looks like a linear function can it be glued together does f arise from a single global function in some sense what we are asking is if there's some non trivial local agreement so not it just barely is you have some extra local non trivial agreement does that imply some non trivial global agreement this is the question which we want to ask the question clear so we want to state these are the sort of as you said if this test passes does that mean that this encoding somehow is coming from a single global linear function or some locally to each part the, the at least the parts where it uh, it's accepted those parts come from some uh, single global linear function this is what we want to ask in fact if you have seen the hardness of proof pay, if we prove several proofs they will go have this sort of flavor to it that is if you have an accept delta we want to show that f is somehow related f is close to being a code word delta close to being a code word actually, the reason why this problem became hard was hard is actually this is just blatantly false we can actually show that the test can pass with probability delta but in fact f can completely look far away from any linear function that is locally it can there can be a delta agreement but yet globally f there might not even be a sing a small a small set of f such that these f corresponds to 
And we'll see that example now. And that's what makes this problem harder than the usual sort of, if you've seen such similar problems in uh, trying to understand uh, the true soundness of various two small low query tests, you'll have always have, it'll always have such a flavor to it. But here is such a, such a statement is just blatantly false and we'll see well, some counter examples to this. Is the test clear what the test is doing? So you have an encoding. So this is the encoding of how a linear function is specified. Now I'm not giving an encoding. I'm giving some purported word. And I want to check, does this word, and what is this word telling me? This word is telling me for every L-dimensional subspace, it's telling me the supposed restriction of the global function to that L-dimensional subspace. And I know that if I take a random edge in the Grassmann test, this sort of some local consistency of delta. And I ask, is there some global consistency? And what can we say? What can we say about f when I, if I have this? Can we say anything non-trivial about f? Question. And we'll see, right now we'll see, let's see that there are some huge counterexamples. Yes. I want to say some structure, something structurally about capital F. So I have, locally I have something about it. I want to say somehow, I want to say something, this is a local sort of, this is a local. The formal local version is exactly this. I do not know what's the statement I want here. And I want to say an obvious statement which I want to write is going to be false because of the counterexample I'm going to say. I want to say some, if F locally sort of agree with each other, I want to say this F actually comes, there must be some global F which is out of, which has some good correlation or whatever, it's close to it. Hmm? Distance in some sense. And we'll see that that's just false. That's just false. We'll see that counterexample. So let's look at this, this one. Let's look at all the points in F2 to the k. Let's leave out the origin. Let's leave out the all zeros. Think of all of this. For corresponding to each of these functions x, let's come up with some arbitrary linear function. This is a random linear function for each x. Now based on this random linear function, I'm going to now define a capital F. So what I'm, how, how am I going to come up with a counterexample? I'm going to give a capital F, that is for every dimensional subspace, I'm going to give a, a linear function on that L-dimensional subspace, which has some sort of local consistency, but there is no global code word that will correspond to it. And how am I going to get that f? Let's also assume some ordering, an arbitrary ordering on f2 k minus the all zeros. One, now I'm going to define f. So the f at l, what am I going to do? I'm going to define it to be fx restricted to L, where x is the small, so look at the points in L, pick the smallest point in x according to this ordering, and just take that random, take that linear function and give the restriction of that linear function on L. So is this clear what I'm doing? So where x is the minimum point in L minus. So for, I have, for every point, I pick a completely new random uh, linear function. And now, I'm coming up with a global co uh, purported code word, which is have the following form. For every L, I'll pick the minimum x in it, and give the restriction of that fx to this L dimensional subspace. Hmm? Now I claim that this f actually has a huge local agreement. Why does it have huge local agreement? If two if L and L prime intersect on a L minus one dimensional subspace, and it so happens that the minimum of both L and L prime happen to be the same x, which happens with constant probability, then they are going to agree. In fact, you can, it's not hard to see that the probability that FL, L intersection L prime is equal to, is actually very close to half over here, or so it's a constant, it's, 
is greater than some, say, one third or something, which is well separated from. So it has a, the, locally it's very consistent with each other. It's this one. But yet, certainly this doesn't look like any single linear function because I could have, it's completely random. This, there's no way I can, from this f, get a single global linear function over here. So this, this sort of this, there's this counterexample sort of staring at our face that you, we can't expect somehow to, with having some form of local agreement, to get any form of global agreement is going to be an impossible task. Okay? Yeah. Yes? That disagrees with capital F No, what do you mean by legitimate? Uh, I mean, like, suppose all, I mean, I picked a specific linear function. And yes. I now say that all. I mean, all subspaces are going to be restrictions of that linear. Like, I'm being honest. Yes, uh, yes. But this particular thing will only say that, you know, on all those subspaces that contain this point x, I agree with the yes. one that you have written. Yeah, which is, a, which, is a, which, is very, very which is a very, very small fraction of this one. Yeah. So, the fra so what you're saying is, this, of course, this does agree with some global f, but on which, on which x? So, if you take, it agrees with f of x, on all L, L dimensions of, on all subspaces L, which contain X, but this is extremely small fraction of this. It's a very small fraction, whereas the local consistency is sort of like a one-third local consistency, but globally it is ha it agrees with Fx, uh, particular Fx, only on all those Ls that contain X, which is a very, very small fraction of this one. If L is much smaller than K, this is a very, very small fraction of Okay. This is one counterexample. This similarly another counterexample which you can give is uh, so this is equally sort of another counterexample that stares at our face is this is sort of you are giving for every x you are giving n. if l contains x is when you are assigning according to f of x. You could also say if L is orthogonal to x, assign it according to f of x. You could have done the, exactly the same thing, f of L is f of x restricted to L if x is, if x, uh, how do I want to state this? If x is the smallest, no, but that's a. Uh, I want to write this if x is the minimum. No, this is. I'm not going to formally write this, but if you could do the exact thing, if x is orthogonal to L, you will also get a counterexample this way. I want to sort of. That you can, these two counter, these sort of counterexample will always exist over here. There will be these global things which are extremely far from being linear, but yet will pass this test with a probability a good half or so. There is, so I'm giving you a word which is a restriction of, which is supposedly the restriction of the linear function on various L-dimensional subspaces. They seem to have some local consistency, in fact, a constant local consistency, but yet they cannot ever be sued together to get a global word. So the best we could hope for is the following sort of theorem. Is the, is the following thing is the following thing is probability accept is greater than delta. Then there exists write this one. So let me define. I'm going to sort of generalize these counterexamples to. I'm going to come up with. So, if Q is some subspace of F2 to the K, think of Q as dimension of Q as some constant. That counterexample was got when which Q is actually the vector space. It's zero comma x. And I'm going to consider. ZQ to be set of all L dimensional subspaces that contain Q. 
this is exactly the set we talked about. It is that part which sort of, it's part of the proof at which agrees with x. Similarly, the other counter example will come with, I choose, this is what I'll, this is a, there's a small, so this is what I'll call zoom. It's a zoom where, I'll call it zoom from below. So these are sort of, these small sets, why are these sets, okay, let me write the other thing also. So W will be another F2K. Here the co-dimension of W will be small. And ZW are those sets L such that L is contained in W. These are what I call zoom from above. Notice that these, these are ZQ and ZW are both subsets of the vertices of the Grassmann graph and they have the property that these sets don't expand at all. If you, you take a vert, you take an a vertex in ZQ hmm, and now choose a random neighbor of it, invariably the random neighbor will also contain Q. Therefore, this is a set which does not expand at all. Most edges, if you are doing the Grassmann test, so the Grassmann test is sort of on this vertex, you are picking a random edge and testing it. So, there is this part ZX, ZQ, in which most edges are not going here and ZQ is a really, really small, uh, small part of the graph. If there are no edges, hardly any edges going outside, on this part I can make it look like a linear function. Similarly, for another ZQ, I can make it look like a linear function. This is over here. So, this, is, this will be comprised of several ZQs. And each of them I can make it look like a linear function because the edges are hardly going out. Within them they will be so perfectly satisfied. This is what I am saying over here. And similarly ZW, so the existence of these small sets, ZQ is, a, so is both ZQ and ZW are non-expanding sets. So, what do, so let's first see what is ZQ. ZQ is, this, is all L dimensional subspace which contain a constant dimensional subspace. Firstly, I want to say ZQ is a, and notice because Q is a constant dimensional subspace, ZQ is a very, very small part of the graph. It's an exponentially small part of the graph. Similarly, ZW is also an exponentially small part of the graph. It's all sets which can, are contained in some subspace of constant co-dimension. Hmm? Now, If you look at ZQ, ZQ, what is the problem? If, so let's look at that example is the example in which Q was just the space 0x. If you take this, what's the probability that if you pick a vertex here that its edge actually goes outside? It's half. The point, how do you go, take a step? This one you pick, basically have to take out a vertex and take out one dimension and add a fresh dimension. Uh, to it. The point is the dimension you take out, you do, are you going to take out the dimension 0x? That's a very small chance of it. It's only half chance of it happening. Therefore, the edge, edges, this is invariably each of these ZQs are going to be non-expanding sets depending on. So, and this graph, so this graph can be broken up into several such ZQs, each of which is non-expanding. So, the Grassmann test is only testing among the edges. So, if it's, if there are hardly any edges going across them, for each of these, I could give it a perfectly linear function. And it will never detect that these two linear functions, the linear function over here and the linear function over here, have no, it will not realize that they have no relation to each other. So this, the non-expanding feature of the Grassmann graph is, got of going to, is, not going to t is going to tell you that you could have put a separate linear function for each of these and yet the test will pass because the edges, there are hardly any edges going across. This is true of both ZQ as well as ZW. ZW also has a similar story. So ZW is even smaller spaces. Huh? This, is the, this is the one dimensional subspace containing 0 and the x, that's it. It's because of GF2 it is just, this is the only. You had a question or? Yeah, so it's, so the, the fact that these are non-expanding sets is what is actually going to give us try such counterexamples. These counterexamples are going to 
happen, is going to be abundant in nature because there are these sort of non-expanding sets in this. Because the Grassmann test is only can test along edges of the graph. If these edges are, don't mix well, for instance, this was a completely isolated part, I could have given a linear function here and nowhere does this linear function have to be consistent with this linear function. So you could have given separate linear functions over here. Of course, these are not disjoint parts, but because they are non-expanding, the amount of edges going across is very little. Most of the edges are contained within its ZQ, and this non-expanding feature of the Grassmann graph is what actually tells you you cannot get a global such structure over here. The best global structure one could hope is the following. That is, if the probability of accept is delta, then there exists a Q and a W of dimension, co-dimension, dimension for Q and co-dimension for W of constant depending on M de delta such that and a glow and a function f and a global function f linear such that when I restrict myself to this q and w, this part of the graph, then it is consistent with the linear function. Then the probability when I pick a random L in ZQ intersection ZW, F restricted to L is actually equal FL is greater than epsilon delta. This is the best one could hope for because of these counter examples. That is, for all delta there exists M, M and M delta and epsilon delta. So that, the that is, if the test passes, then there is a small part of the graph in which such a thing happens. We can't guarantee anything better than this. So this was actually, this was the original conjecture post in one of the papers. This is the conjecture post in DKK MS 16. We can't say anything stronger than this, and they said that this is, you could say this. If ever the test passes the probability delta, that means there should be a small part of the graph in which you have such a consistency. And what the one of the paper, the paper, Dinur et al. were able to show is, suppose we were able to prove this property of the Grassmann graph, then it, suffi it suffices to finish the proof. With using this, you can prove the 2 to 2 games theorem or the 2 to 1 games theorem. That this, uh, KKMS. So let's call this conjecture, the, I'll call this conjecture the, the acceptance probability conjecture. The DKKMS showed that implies the 2 to 2 games theorem which I had stated. Notice by the counter example I said this is the best you can hope and what they show is if you can prove this fact about the Grassmann then we can prove the 2 to 2 games theorem. Okay, I think I've lost people. Okay, what I'm trying to say is the Grassmann test by itself cannot tell anything globally because this is a non-expanding graph. There are, the graph has several really tiny small sets which do not expand at all. Therefore, you won't be able to tell anything global. But what we are saying is, okay, I'm not going to ask for anything global. I'm going to ask that there is a very small part of the graph. The, notice that this is an extremely tiny part of the graph. Hmm? In that tiny part, it agrees with a, some global linear function. As long as we can say this, then they said you can prove the 2 to 2 games theorem. By the way, why is the Grassmann test graph, I stated the Grassmann graph, so I said completeness, soundness. Notice the Grassmann graph has a 2 to 2 flavor to it. Why does it have a 2 to 2 flavor to it? So if I ask one L dimensional subspace a, a linear function, what are the number of possibilities for the other L prime dimensional subspace? Which will be consistent with it? 
basically they have to fully agree on the intersection. So the L minus one dimensional intersection has been determined. The only freedom is the new dimension and that it has two possibilities could be either zero or one on the new dimension. Therefore given an answer to given an answer to where was the test given an answer to FL what are the possibilities for FL prime that will make this pass there are only two possibilities. Similarly given a possibility for FL prime what are the possibilities this is why the Grassmann test is a two to two test. You can make it a two to one test if you are instead of testing L versus L dimensional subspaces versus L dimensional subspaces, you test L dimensional subspaces versus L minus one dimensional subspaces, this will be a two to one test. So the Grassmann test we have is the following property, it is a two to one, two to two test. It has this completeness property, soundness property, we do not have this, but what Dinur et al showed us, if we have even this weaker soundness property that is sufficient to finish the proof of the two to two games theorem. Actually this is, this is fairly standard uh, but for one step in that if you are familiar with the PCP house done, if you have such a, if you can get any such global statement then you can manage to pro, use this as a gadget in the hardness reduction. This is typical of this except for one step. It, uh, the hard part of it is actually this conjecture. Why is this such a, is such a conjecture even true? We know that you can't prove anything better than this, but can you even show that on such a small part there is some consistency? So the question. What you can then, what was then shown is that this statement can be restated as now. So far, I have I had the Grassmann graph and I have a test on the Grassmann graph, whereas I gave for every vertex a linear function and all. Now let's just look at the Grassmann graph, whereas you notice the counterexample came because of these non-expanding sets in it. So let's try to understand what what, do, what are expanding sets. So given any set of vert vertices of the Grassmann graph, let's define the staying probability of yes to be precisely pick a random edge LL prime among the edges, it is a probability that L prime is in S conditioned on, so if you pick a, ran, uh, pick a random uh, vertex in S, what is the probability that its neighbor according to the Grassmann graph is also in S, this is the staying probability. What we want, want to say is, so this statement what we want to say is we are going to have the following staying conjecture. We know that ZQs and ZWs are sets which have huge staying probabilities. These are sets which are non-expanding. Those are the sets with this one. And I want to say that those are the only sets that have this feature. That is, if S satisfies saying probability of S is theta, then there exists Q and W of dimension dimension m delta such that probability if you pick a random L from ZQ intersection ZW, the probability that, that L is in S is greater than epsilon delta. That is if you focus yourself on this small part of the graph, then that small part of the graph does contain, once again the statement will go like for all delta there exists M and epsilon such that this is true. This is what I am trying to say that the only non-expanding sets are basically sets of this form. Notice these are two different conjectures. This is a conjecture about the Grassmann graph. This is a conjecture about the Grassmann test. And of course the counter example for both came because of small non-expanding sets in the Grassmann graph, the ZQs and ZWs. And both of these are sort of stating that these are the only counterexamples. The, those are the only counterexample. If any set has a considerable probability of staying in, then it is because it looks large in one of these uh, small part of the graph. There is a zoom from below and zoom from above. If you focus, if you go, if you go to, the, if you narrow down to that small part of the graph, there S has considerable density. The only reason S can have large staying probability is because in some zoom in zoom out, S looks 
become very large. And see, here it says that if the probability of the test accepting is large, it's because there is a zoom in, zoom out, and a corresponding linear function says so that on that zoom from below, zoom about, this linear function agrees with f on a considerable fraction of this. Yeah. For which kind? This intersection is really, really tiny. It's, so think of, I'm going to think of delta as something as a, a small but constant. And so this is, this is going exponentially small in k. Yeah, so these, so this is only telling in this very small part, S has a large density, but not globally at all. So if delta, if you're going to think of delta as exponential in K, then this does just tell you something. Yeah. What are we doing with respect to time? So the sequence of works that went about. Yeah, you need both zoom from above and zoom from below. Zoom from above and zoom from below. So, tell you what the sequence of works. So, this conjecture was made in the second of the papers, DKK MS 17. So, it was the, the, the sequence of works showed that first the staying conjecture implies the acceptance probability conjecture. This was actually, it was proved in DK, it was in KMS 17, but it's more actually, it's Kotari and Steurer. And then the final paper, which this quote Munzer Safra 18, showed that the staying conjecture is. Theorems wise, that's what actually filled the proof they showed. The, the, the first of the theorems showed that the acceptance probability conjecture is true, then the 2 to 2 games theorem is true. Then reduced it to fact, this was a conjecture on the Grassmann gra test. This was reduced to just a conjecture on the Grassmann graph. So now we want to ask what are the structure of non-expanding sets in the Grassmann graph? And the conjecture was the only non-expanding set, if any set does not expand, it has considerable staying probability, then that is because that set has a reasonable mass in some zoom in, zoom out. This could be a very tiny fraction of the graph, but there is some time reasonable mass in some zoom in, zoom out. So it was shown that the staying conjecture implies the acceptance probability conjecture. And finally, you can show, on the, the last of the papers showed that the staying conjecture in fact true. It showed that all the non-expanding sets in the Grassmann graph have this feature. How am I doing with respect to time? And let's see how, time up to five minutes, okay. So which part should I? Okay, so. Let's actually go into trying to, I'll say some statements on how the final statement was proven. That is, I want to show that these are the only sets that do not expand. Hmm? So how does one show, you have a graph and you have a sort of, you have a graph here and you know there is a set S which does not expand much. How do you want, how does one expect to show some structural property of the set yes. So given any, so let H be the, in. so we have some S for which the staying probability of S is large. And we want, so these are the, so S is a set which is non-expanding in the Grassmann graph, or particularly any graph, S is a set that is, the staying probability with an X is large. Now I want to say get some structure of S. So what's the best way to do it? So we'll apply a spectral analysis to say something about one. 
So what's, what do I mean spectral analysis? Now let's look at the adjacency matrix of the graph rather the normalized adjacency matrix of this graph. Let V1, V2, Vn be its, this is, that's a real symmetric matrix so it has an eigen decomposition that V1, V2, Vn be its eigenvectors. One will be one and then it will, let's put them in decreasing order, eigenvectors. It's a transition probability so this is going to be greater than or equal to minus one. So this is how it's going to look like. And what does this say? So this is, the stay probability is large. So let's look at H which is the indicator function of S. Is just H is a function from the vertex set to the reals which is just indicated. It takes one or zero depending on this one. Fact that stay of S is large is just this is if and only if H adjacency H, this is exactly the probability that you stay, this is large. This is just rewriting. But H we can write it in the eigen decomposition. So H let's write it as summation A i V i. So H A H is just going to be summation A i square lambda i. And the claim is this is large. Hmm? Now if this has to be large, the components corresponding to small lambda cannot contribute to this. this. So H is, has to have all its, most of its weight only on eigenvectors which are, which have large lambdas. Because if H had, H had most of its weight on eigenvectors which have small lambdas, this quantity is a small quantity. So this already it will tell us the support of H, the support of H is mostly on eigenvectors with large lambda, large absolute value lambda. The H has to be, if the staying probability of, of, a, of, a, of a particular set is large, that means if you look at the corresponding indicator vector, when you write it on the eigen basis, it should be mostly spread out values close to one. It can't have values very small because then this quantity will be small. So we have, so in some sense H looks as H depends only on a few eigenvectors. Let's ignore the ones on which it has smaller. H depends on a few eigenvectors and that's where all of its mass comes from. So H looks something like just summation AI. Hi, I going just one to t. It's just a few of them. But because H is a Boolean function, we know that the fourth norm of H and the second norm of H square, these both are the same quantity, which is exactly mu, which is the density of H. In particular, it tells you that Fourth norm of H is like mu to the one fourth, while the second H is more like square root mu. Hmm? So, in particular, it tells you if mu, if mu is small, the fourth norm is considerably larger than the second norm. So, it sort of has this feature that a, small, a, staying, a set which stays should have the fourth norm to be. So, this is the, the mu is all the ex, mu is mu is the expected size of expected value of H with a number less than one. So for small mu's, so this says the fourth norm is considerably larger than the second norm. Huh? Norms are all, everything is expectation. Yeah, I mean H, this is the first, this is the first norm. Yeah, in this world everything, all norms are expectations. 
The fourth norm is considerably larger than the second norm. But if you've seen sort of activity, this statement of hyperconductivity states this is not usually the case. That is, graph is hyperconductivity. The graph is hypercontractive. Will say you something about the fourth norm being small compared to second norm. That's what hyperconductivity results tell you. Of course, it's unclear if the Grassmann graph is hypercontractive. In fact, it is not hypercontractive because if it were hypercontractive, then there cannot be any small set that expands. So what we will try to do is now we'll look at the fourth norm versus second norm of the Grassmann graph. You can look at its eigen decomposition, write down the fourth norm, write down the second norm, say how much, when can the fourth norm be considerably larger than the second norm. You just expand the structure out and then realize the only times it will happen is when you have such zoom ins and zoom outs. You just open out the expansion of the fourth norm and second norm and ask when is the fourth norm of this larger than the second norm of this considerably larger. Write down the expression of it. When is hyperconductivity violated? Write it down and you'll notice that the only time when this happens is when there exists such a zoom in and zoom out. And so that's actually a sort of a brute force calculation of it. It will be nicer to get a better this one. This page is Proof is a runs around 60 pages or so. It's a sort of a case by case analysis. It looks at H. So it sort of writes H in the eigenbasis of, of the Johnson graph, of the Grassmann graph. And compares H4 versus H2. So we do know that H4 is considerably larger than H2 because it's Boolean. And furthermore, we also know H is sitting only on the low order part of this one. So using those both, they look at this and eventually conclude that H actually, H has the structure that you want. H has, H is correlated with a Z, some ZQ intersection ZW. And this is actually just open it out. You just open out H, this one, open out this one, write it down in the eigenbasis. The eigen, if, if I had time, I could go into it. The eigenbasis will tell you why the eigenbasis naturally gives out why ZQs and ZWs are going to come out in the process. I think I will stop. Yeah, the eigenbases of National Grassmann graph are, so it's, so what are the, let's look at the, it's a, what are the noisy, the noisy hypercube, the eigenbases are basically the parity functions. For the hypercube sort of thing are the parity functions. What happens to be the basis, um, let me just write it. We'll define a sequence of functions j less than or equal to 0 So j less than or equal to i. So to cut any function f on the Grassmann i comma k. So it's on just i dimensional subspaces in k. And if f can be written as, f of l can be written as summation f of l prime, l prime contained in l, l prime. So you go, so f is some arbitrary function on i, just depends on, so it's sort of like, so the usual parity functions in which you had was a function depend only on d coordinates. The d, degree d part depends on d coordinates. Here it's, I will say it depends on the ith, ith level of this will be take a function which just depends on i dimensional subspaces and I'll extend it to l dimensional subspaces by just in this standard way. That is sum over this, uh, I'm, uh, from, from a function which depends on i dimensional subspaces, I'm going to get a function which on l dimensional subspaces by doing this. So this function is not purely an l dimensional function, it's a function which only depends on i dimensions. And what we can show is these have a, the j less than or equal to zero are the constant functions. Then you have functions which depends only on one dimensional subspace, whether a particular one dimensional subspace is contained in L or not and so on. And you have this sort of decomposition. 
you, it can be shown this is in recomposition and basically the, so then you take j equals 0, the orthogonal part of these guys in their respect to, so j, j equal to i is, is a subset of j less than or equal to i but orthogonal to j less than equal to i minus 1. So that is the or, uh, sort of the degree decomposition for the Grassmann graph. Somebody else? 